Welcome to Edison Open House Global Healthcare 2022. In this session, we want to introduce you to Sega Technologies. They're a very unusual company which develops medical countermeasures against biological, radiological, and chemical threats. And with me is its CEO, Phil Gomez. Phil, it's a delight to see you again. And you have this extraordinary company which has an asset, its principal asset, TPOX, for a disease that actually currently nobody has. So explain it to us. Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, Vivian, smallpox is fortunately a disease that was eradicated on the globe in the 70s thanks to a vaccination campaign. But although no one's currently infected with it in the globe, we worry about it quite a bit. We worry about it because uh, there's been publications, it would likely be easy to synthesize in the lab. There are likely um, uh, entities around the globe that may want to keep it as a bioterrorism agent. And the challenge is, since we haven't been immunizing, if there ever was an outbreak, there's been a variety of publications and models to show it would be devastating. It, it had a historical 30% fatality rate. It killed through over 300 million people in the last century, and it would spread very rapidly. So it's important and the U.S. government especially has supported us to develop this drug as a treatment for smallpox in case it reemerges uh, over time. So um, that's been a key partnership with us with the U.S. government. As you said, we developed this drug, started selling it to the government in 2011. I got FDA approval in 2018, and I'm very pleased to talk about our, our European Union EMA approval that occurred this week. So I'm happy to talk about it. So presumably the pandemic that we are currently in has focused minds about the, the, the wisdom of having these drugs and solutions on standby. Absolutely. And, you know, there's been a couple interviews in which uh, Bill Gates, even before the pandemic, when asked what, what does he worry about globally that could disrupt economies and public health, he talked about pandemics, including what if smallpox reemerged. And I think what we've learned is um, a variety of things. One is uh, pandemics are not only public health emergencies, they're economic emergencies. There can be a uh, dramatic uh, impact. And so the stakes have been made clear uh, globally as to what a pandemic can do. I think we've also learned about where we are with responses. Uh, smallpox was eradicated with a vaccination campaign, um, many of which required uh, mandates and high vaccination. And we haven't seen that with COVID. Uh, and what we have seen is the emergence of the importance of therapeutics. So in the U.S., um, the U.S. government is procuring a large number, more than 5 million courses of an oral um, treatment drug for COVID, exactly because we need to have many tools in the toolbox to bring a pandemic under control. And that's illustrated why it's important to have drugs like ours available for something like an outbreak of smallpox. So there is also something called the 100 Days Strategy, which also helps uh, your company. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so um, it was developed uh, within the G7 and published. And in fact, the U.S. Biden administration has also published in September a, a strategy for future pandemics. And what that talks about is one strategy is to look at viral families. So um, I happen to be at the National Institutes of Health when we developed a SARS vaccine. Uh, in retrospect, what we probably should have done was developed a pan-coronavirus vaccine so that when MERS and COVID evolved, we would have been broadly prepared. And so there's been a lot of discussion of focusing on these families of virus, things like filovirus, for Ebola, coronavirus um, as a family. And smallpox is a member of what's called the orthopox family. And uh, here in the U.S., we've developed two vaccines and two therapeutics for smallpox and um, we just got approval in the European Union for not only smallpox, uh, but monkeypox, cowpox, and vaccinia, other orthopox viral infections. And as we learned with COVID-19, we think that is a very good strategy. It's a great example of the public health community preparing us for a family of viruses, being able to respond should they reemerge. Because although, as we pointed out, smallpox currently doesn't have infections, although there's a great threat of potential infections, Monkeypox shows up um, throughout the globe. It's unfortunately having increased cases in um, Central Africa, can have up to a 10% fatality rate. We've seen cases in London. We had a patient in the US in Dallas and Baltimore. And so it's a great example of preparing for one threat, but making sure you have a, a treatment or a countermeasure that can work broadly. And we're very fortunate that TPOX works broadly and we're very grateful to the EMA for working with us 
um, to get the approval for that broad indication. So the U.S. has bought a, a, a big stock, and presumably that stock lasts for quite a long time before they then have to replace it. So what's the addressable market uh, globally, and how does your label expansion that you've achieved uh, address that and increase it? Yeah, so maybe let's talk a little bit about how governments think about buying our drugs. So typically the public health and, and often military professionals think about the threat, they make it a determination of what a potential smallpox, monkeypox, whatever the outbreak might be, um, would be. They then determine um, what kind of countermeasures, what kind of uh, drugs, vaccines they want to buy. Uh, and then they would issue requests for proposals from, from companies like us. In the U.S., that first part is classified. Um, it's, not, it's not broadcast or shared. Most countries don't share that. Um, and then there's also a cut around budgets. There are a lot of threats out there. So people develop their annual budgets with their parliament or their Congress uh, and then issue those RFPs. So we see what comes out in the RFP. And as you point out, for the U.S. government back in 2011, um, they issued a contract to us for 1.7 million courses. They also had contemplated up to 12 million courses as part of options associated with that discussion. But really, the 1.7 reflects that whole process, including what they could, so to speak, afford. I think the pandemic has shown us that, that there is great reason why more than that would be appropriate for the stockpile. And we have an indication for post-exposure prophylaxis developing that I'm excited to talk about that, that could at least double that number in the stockpile. But when we think broadly, um, we've sold to the US government. We had 47 million in contracts issued from Canada, um, which I credit greatly for doing that during the pandemic. I think a lot of countries have struggled with their response to COVID and put initiatives like uh, countering smallpox um, on pause while they're responding to that. But with the EMA approval, we do think there's substantial opportunities in Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia. It is a nascent market because this is something that people have to think about long-term protection. There's not a lot of precedent. So we're really um, driving that market with our partner, Meridian Medical Technologies, that's been selling products like this for decades. And we look forward to uh, building on what we've done in Canada in the U.S. and using the EMA approval as a way to uh, work with our colleagues in Europe to, to, to get the right solutions out there. Because even the WHO in their Varila meeting had, had uh, stated they would like to see stockpiles of smallpox antivirals. And so we think uh, those that lead global health know this is a big challenge, know these products need to be available. Um, and we're looking forward to, to working with people to stockpile them. And then to your last point around how does monkeypox change it, I think it, it brings it from not only a, a theoretical risk that's very important to a real risk that uh, unfortunately patients could show up at your doorstep in the UK, uh, in Germany, France, uh, wherever um, travel happens, and we all know that happens a lot. Uh, and so being prepared not only for the catastrophic smallpox event, but also another orthopox infection um, that could get uh, transmitted is critical for, for countries. There's still a lot of speculation about the exact source of the current uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, but there part of it might be uh, escape from the laboratory. And it's not a fanciful thing to say escape from the laboratory for smallpox because there are some stocks of smallpox uh, around the world. So that's not science fiction. Yeah, so we often talk about with, with smallpox, it could be a, a, an accidental release and you know, there were vials a few years back found in the NIH uh, that were of rilovirus that had been stored away long, long ago. There was a there was a bit of a scare at the end of last year. Some vials labeled smallpox were at a uh, pharmaceutical factory in near Philadelphia. It turned out they weren't smallpox. They were actually vaccinivirus, the vaccine used in the vaccine. Um, but you never know. And there are active programs both at the U.S. CDC and in Russia to maintain the varilla virus. And there used to be a lot of debate about should those stocks be destroyed, but with the advent of DNA synthesis, even if they were destroyed, you could synthesize and create it again. So accidental release, whether it's one of those labs or someone more purposefully um, trying to develop and accidentally releasing it even before they did is, is a real threat. Yeah, so it's not a, you know, we're not talking conspiracy theories, this is, uh, the, or, or film scripts, this is, you know, real and genuine threat that actually people are really alive to now. Thinking about the next six to 12 months, Phil, what should investors look out for? 
Um, so first, uh, our continued partnership with the U.S. government. Um, we continue to get orders. We got orders last year and, and getting those deliveries, which drive the bulk of our revenue and, and the future options coming down the pike. Um, we applied for approval of our intravenous formulation. So for those that couldn't swallow a pill, we applied last year. Um, we anticipate approval this year, and we do have uh, active um, orders for that product that, that will start delivery um, to the U.S. government. Um, we also have a post-exposure prophylaxis program, as I mentioned. What that is, is if you were potentially exposed, but you haven't yet tested positive for smallpox, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to be able to take our drug for immediate protection, but also get a vaccine for longer-term protection. And that would be a great way to mitigate an outbreak to give a vaccine, give our drug, and if you were infected or not, it's a one-stop intervention. And so we're doing a clinical study to show we do not reduce the immunogenicity of the smallpox vaccine. That'll start this year, and we expect immunogenicity data. And with that program, um, in our discussions with FDA, we've described we would want to treat for 28 days instead of 14 days. So that would require essentially twice as much drug in the stockpile to maintain. So um, that's an important program for us to be able to expand our label. Um, we also are looking at other international sales with the EMA approval. And finally, um, probably a little longer term than six to 12 months, but we are in discussions to transition to our next contract with the government to be able to resupply. And we anticipate that'll be a more steady year by year contract. The current contract we have is lumpy. There are four options over seven years, so it ends up being lumpy in the revenue. But we've got a lot of exciting things going on at the company and looking forward to updating uh, our shareholders and investors on those in the coming 12 months. Phil, it's always fascinating talking to you. And I know I probably speak for everybody watching this. We're very glad you're there. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you, Vivian. Take care. Have a great day.